what the hell are you doing in Ukraine? So it's a war zone. It's cold as shit. You know, like what's going on in that here. coconut of yours? Like, what are you thinking? Well, I live here. I've been living here in Ukraine, uh, in Kharkov, which is in East Ukraine. I've been living here off and on since 2016. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I had some business that I was doing in London, and uh, that's when I started doing uh, Coach Red Pill Channel back in 2017. Yeah. And um, it was really a hobby because I had a lot of free time on my hands while I was in London doing my, uh, my business affairs. And uh, the channel took off, and so I just continued it. And um, then in 2019, I had another business deal that was going down. And so I, I was sort of like splitting my time between Kharkov and Amsterdam. When I was in London, it was sort of like, you know, one week in Kharkov and one week in, in London, and then the same thing in Amsterdam. And uh, COVID, uh, the COVID lockdown caught me there in um, March of 2020. And I was, was stuck in Amsterdam, really, for most of 2020. And then I rode my motorcycle back from um, from Amsterdam to Kharkov um, in what December of 2020, mm -hmm. and I've been living here ever since, and very happily so, until this this little war happened, you know. And uh, exactly a year ago today, a year ago right now, as I'm speaking to you, I had flown out to Kiev on some business and some just bureaucratic stuff I had to take care of. I went to mm -hmm. Kiev uh, on the 23rd of February, 2022. And at this time, it's 6 p.m. here as I'm speaking to you, I was having drinks with some business acquaintances um, in at my hotel, the, the Premier Palace in Kiev, just off Krishatik Avenue. And uh, I, I recall this all very vividly because you know uh, that evening, rather than go out to dinner or anything, I just decided to you know, dash over down the street to the McDonald's there and, and get some Mickey D's and just chill out in front of cable. And I fell asleep until like 530 in the morning when my assistant here in Kharkov gave me a call and said, the Russians are invading. <laughs> and so for the first week of the invasion, I was in Kiev and um, I wound down my uh, my Coach Red Pill channel in uh, late 2021 because yeah. I was just getting tired of it. You know, and mm -hmm. I was just winding down the whole thing. And, um, you know, but I still had the channel with, you know, a quarter of a million, 300,000 subs or whatever it was. And I started doing these impromptu videos from Kershatik Avenue, which is like the main drag, or, or not the main drag, but the, the principal avenue of, of Kiev, sort of like the Wilshire Boulevard of, of Kiev or, or, you know, the, the Madison Avenue of Kiev. And uh, I started doing these impromptu videos talking about the situation on the ground in the middle of Kiev. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, I'm this geopolitical commentator. And of course, since this conflict is ongoing, I've continued making videos because, you know, it, it directly affects my life, you know. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I was I was in Kiev from the 24th until my birthday, the night before my birthday. Uh, when I took the train back to Kharkov and uh, I, I was here on the 1st of March and I've been here since then and uh, I, I arranged for the evacuation of my family and they're out of the country and for various reasons I decided to stay because I didn't think that this war would last this long. Mm -hmm. um, I mean if somebody had told me back in March of last year that it would, you, we'd be here a year later talking about this I would have been shocked and what's emerged um, What's very interesting is that the Kiev regime and the Russians had actually reached a ceasefire agreement in early April of last year. And it was the West, the Washington, you know, deep state crowd, the State Department crowd that uh, put the kibosh on that. They told Zelensky in no uncertain terms that he should not sign any kind of ceasefire or, or any kind of agreement with the Russians. And it's because of Washington that this war has continued for a year with literally hundreds of thousands of deaths uh, on the side of the Zelensky regime. It's been a what's the um, what are the um, what's the uh, death count right now on both sides? Do you have any idea? Yeah, the casualty figures. Uh, these are the last reputable figures that are the most conservative and the most like for sure. OK. Uh, they come from two sources. Um, the, the the lowest casualty figures for the Russian for the, uh, the Zelensky regime, rather, for the Ukraine side, they have uh, killed in action one hundred and fifty-seven thousand. 
uh, wounded in action, likely about 150% of that number. So you're, you're talking roughly about 240,000 men who have been uh, wounded, incapacitated. Okay, so between those two figures, you're talking in total four, 400,000 men are out of commission. Mm -hmm. Between that 157 killed and that 240 that are incapacitated. Um, on the Russian side, uh, these are Western figures, by the way, or, or figures critical of the Russians. Uh, the BBC puts the number of confirmed dead um, Russian uh, LPR forces, DPR forces, Wagner and Chechens. They put them at minimum 12,000 killed and perhaps maximum 20,000. The Israelis, the Mossad, puts it at 18,850 as of January 22nd or something like that. And, so the uh, Russians are destroying the Ukrainians. Yeah, it's uh, lopsided across the board in terms of equipment lost, in terms it's of... It's a slaughter. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's lopsided as all get out. Yeah. Because, I mean, the news here, if you consume public news media, would, would purport that um, the Russians are really getting a lot of resistance. Uh, go Zelensky. Um, you know, they're probably going to win, blah, blah, blah. But you're saying on the ground there, the, it's, it's really just a slaughter. Yeah, the, the figure, it, it's roughly in terms of men, materiel across every weapons class, it's, it's a lopsided figure of between 8 to 1 against the Zelensky regime and uh, as low as 4 to 1 insofar as helicopters specifically. Insofar as artillery pieces, I think it's something like 20 to 1. <clears throat> and so, I mean, no, it, it's, it's just incredibly lopsided. Because What's the population of Ukraine? Uh, before the war, uh, the official number was 45 million. Okay. Uh, but because of the people who have left, roughly 15 million people have left, a third mm -hmm. of the population. Uh, they've left something like 4 million have gone to Russia and 11 million have gone to the West. And so you discount that, you discount to the uh, 9 million people who are now in the territories that Russia has annexed. That's about, yeah, like I said, 9 million. And so right now, the population of Ukraine, the credible estimates from multiple sources, is a range between 19 million and 22 million. Yeah, so you, they've, they've cut the population in half. And, uh, and this mm -hmm. isn't over yet. You know, Would you call this a proxy yet. war? And what do you think of it? Oh, yeah, it's, of course, it's a proxy war between uh, NATO and Russia. You know, uh, NATO, the State Department, specifically um, Victoria Newland who is the Undersecretary of State for uh, Political Affairs, Anthony Blinken, who's supposed to be the Secretary of State, but who's really, uh, Victoria Newland is the number one. And uh, Joe Biden himself and the National Security Advisor, um, what's his name, Jeff <coughs> Sullivan. What they want is regime change in Russia. And they're using Ukraine and the sanctions and throwing away the European economy to create that regime change in Russia. And they failed. They failed miserably. Mm -hmm. I mean, because in, right now, Putin in Russia, and this is according to polls by anti-Putin uh, sectors, um, put his approval rating at somewhere between 70 and 80 percent. OK, so, so I mean, you know, he, he's uh, nothing's going on. And also what's what's happened is that, see, back in 2014, 15, when Russia annexed Crimea, the Crimean Peninsula, uh, the United States put impose a whole bunch of sanctions, which really hurt the Russian economy back then. And what's happened is that since then, the Russians have prepared for sanctions war, and they prepared very diligently. And in fact, they overprepared because what happened was that the sanctions that came in 2022, which were a lot more severe because they disconnected Russia from SWIFT, they um, absconded really with the the Russian central bank's assets in the West and, and other measures that they took. But what happened was that those sanctions had less of an effect on the Russian economy than the sanctions back in 2015. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, in uh, March, April, there was like, you know, the ruble shot up, you know, the mm -hmm. Moscow stock market crashed. But then it kind of like recovered because everybody started realizing, hey, you know, this isn't hurting that bad. And the Russians also discovered that they had all these customers in India and China for their uh, energy resources and, and their exports. And so losing the European economy, the Western economies, in fact, didn't really hurt the Russian economy. And, and more, more importantly, 
It opened up new opportunities and new markets in India and China. And so now they are selling more than before the war. They are doing better economically now than before the war. Okay. Mm. And even the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which is a Western uh, organization, even they admit the fact that the Russian economy is doing gangbusters and their inflation is projected to be for 2023, something like maybe four, 5%, something like that. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and, and overall, they're just, this didn't hurt the Russian economy at all. It just crippled the, the German economy and the European economy overall. And on top of that, you have, of course, that the United States carried out this terrorist attack on the Nord Stream pipeline, <coughs> which condemned. Has that uh, been, hmm? has that been Go confirmed ahead. by a good source? Oh, yeah. yeah, by yeah. Seymour Hirsch. Seymour Hirsh is the, the that? best investigative uh, journalist you can find. Seymour Hirsh mm -hmm. has been around for five decades. He broke the My Lai massacre in 1968. He also uh, broke the story of the Abu Ghraib. Um, uh, um, torture of prisoners by the Americans in Iraq and the, the, the clandestine bombing of Cambodia, a bunch of stories. I mean, he, he's, you know, as, as gold standard as you can get insofar as investigative journalism. And a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago now, he released a, a, a very detailed piece as to who, what, where, why, insofar as Nord Stream. And the decision was made in the fall of 2021 by Joe Biden himself in coordination with Victoria Newland and uh, Jake Sullivan to bomb the Nord Stream pipeline. Jake Sullivan was the point man for that operation and um, in, in Seymour Hersh's piece, which has gotten zero play in the mainstream media. I mean, nothing, they don't talk about it at all. This guy has won a Pulitzer Prize. He published in the New Yorker, the New York Times. I mean, this is as gold standard as you can get and they have totally, you know, memory hold it, not even memory hold it, just ignored it like it, has not happened, although the rest of the world has most certainly paid attention to it. And the Americans indisputably bombed the Nord Stream pipeline, and this crippled the German economy. And, uh, the, you know, the German economy is toast. I mean, they are fucked to, to, to high heaven. Right now, their inflation, food inflation, is at 20%. You know? and, and sorry, the Nord Stream pipeline was a gas supply line from Russia to, was it, was it through Denmark into Germany? No, it was under the Baltic Sea from from Russia to Germany under the Baltic Sea, okay. uh, and it passed by Denmark. And what has yeah. emerged from from uh, Seymour Hersh's reporting is that the Danes, the Swedes, and the Norwegians and the Poles knew that this was coming. And in fact, it was the Norwegians who pulled the trigger, who actually detonated the bombs that the Americans placed in June of 2022 during this big Baltic uh, Sea exercise that they did. Mm -hmm. That's when the American divers put in these uh, explosives. You gotta understand that these explosives, they're not like a little package of C4 and they blow it up. No, it's like a really complicated thing because they have to dig up you know, the pipeline because it's covered. And the kind of uh, explosives you're talking about are you know, a couple hundred pounds per, uh, per charge. And they had uh, two charges on each of the four pipelines. And so, so it was a major operation logistically to carry it out. And it was apparently the Norwegians who pulled the trigger on it. And <coughs> that, that's just, you know, and Norway is part of NATO. The United States is part of NATO. Yeah. Germany is part of NATO. So Germany's own allies fucked them over for money. That's the worst part because the Norwegians' um, uh, 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 motivation was that they would be able to sell their natural gas that they have quite a bit of, but more expensive than Russian gas they'd be able to sell their gas to Germany. And the United States also had that financial motivation to sell American liquefied natural gas to the Germans, quite apart from the geopolitical aspects of it. So it's really yeah, fucking despicable. Yeah, I don't, I don't recall much outrage or much coverage on this fact. No. I mean, people are still outraged over, over, over pronouns or something. Pronouns and you know. balloons. Yeah. Balloons and wokeness or something is getting way more media coverage, and that's what people get upset about. Um, I'm sure there's probably more people that are still pissed off that others aren't, haven't haven't gone and jabbed themselves, you know, to comply, you know, with the new thing. Uh, yeah, it's a clown world, you know. It's a clown. <laughs> we it's a we call this a clown world show, right? Yeah, it's, it's a complete shit show at this point. No, I mean, like every day, the kind of bullshit that's going on, it, it's just off the charts.
it, it's just way off the charts. You know, I mean, every outrage that you see every day, you know, and, and I mean, this kind of thing, I mean, like one of these incidents, okay, I mean, 10, 20 years ago would have been front page news across the world. But the American media is total propaganda. The Canadian media is total propaganda. You're, you're not going to hear what's going on if you follow the mainstream news sources. Yeah. I really hope you guys enjoyed that clip. If you want to watch the full length podcast, you can find that over here, that clips from. If you're newer to the channel, make sure you hit subscribe over here and pin down below in the top comment. You'll find a bunch of useful links to my website, my supplement line books, and a bunch of other stuff. Have an amazing day. Peace out.